Here's another fragment of a Manichaean text. Uh, here we go, our Manichaeans, uh, scribes, and something in Sogdian, again, a Middle Iranian language being written down. Another reason why Mani is so popular is that he is, he has people who are multilingual. There are scribes who actually translate or you know, write down his ideas in many different languages. Mani says, one of my miracles is that I am able to say what I say in different languages. Everyone can understand what I'm saying. He says, well, Buddha came before me. Jesus came before me. Zoroaster came before me. But usually they came in one language, what they reveal. My ideas are written down in different languages, so humanity can understand it. And so that is another reason for Manichaean spread, and also Mani calls it a miracle to be able to do so. And probably in antiquity, that was a miracle. Other activities associated with the Manichaeans, again, a fragment of a Manichaean text, is that we're told that these sacred Manichaean texts were recited or sung along with music. Again, uh, you should think of uh, early church, be it Christianity, and some other uh, traditions where singing the holy hymns was a part of this communal interaction. And the Manichaeans did it, and of course they produced beautiful manuscripts. Uh, as a record of their existence. If they hadn't left us these, of course, and they, haven't, they hadn't been found in Turfan, we would know far less about them. But it's that discovery that makes it so fascinating. So you have merchants, monks, and priests spreading religion and ideas on the Silk Road. Uh, who are these people? They're Sogdians, Bactrians, Chinese, and Persian merchants. Uh, who are spreading Zoroastrianism, Christianity, Buddhism, and Manichaeism. Now, if you bear with me, I have just one more uh, topic to cover, uh, and that is these most famous traders on the subroad, the Sogdians. The Sogdians were the best of the traders. Nobody could match them, probably, in their smartness and their economic activity, and they were quite wealthy. Uh, I think this fresco also gives us a sense of their wealth, of what is going on. And these Sogdians, uh, let's see where Sogdiana is on the map. Uh, well, here's the map. So here's Sogdiana. And Sogdiana, and we have actually a very nice letter of a sale of a slave girl in Sogdian at the museum here. If you get a chance, definitely go visit the museum and see that letter, the Sogdian letter. Uh, I went with my colleague Johan and his professor, Dr. Sherwood, who teaches at Harvard last time, and of course, Sherwood was just reading it off. Oh yes, here's the letter, and he was, of course, text testing him as well. But uh, in these uh, Sogdians, we find uh, these Iranian speakers who traverse from Iran to China from first century all the way to the 10th century of Common Era. Again, they're wealthy traders and businessmen who really know how to make money, basically. And that is where they are. And here's our Turfan area where they stop, and these documents, Sogdian documents, were found as well. Well, they do this through, very importantly, Bactrian camels. When we talk about camels, we think of, of course, sometimes, uh, some of us, Arabia. But we should remember the Bactrian camels, the two hump one, as opposed to the one hump Arabian camel. Excellent animals to traverse the Taklamakan Desert, these deserts that are very difficult to bypass from China to the west. It's the Bactrian camel that uh, allows this long distance trade, and the Sogdians are the trading people. If you don't believe me that they're very good traders, these uh, Iranian Sogdians, let's go back to our Sima Chen and see what he says about the Sogdians. He says, all of the states from Daiwan, Sogdiana, west of Anhi, Parthia, speak rather different languages, their customs are generally similar, and their languages mutually intelligible. Why? Because Bactrian and Sogdian and Persian, these are Iranian languages. So we know that they already understood themselves at the time of Simachen in the first century. But then he goes on to say, the men all have deep set eyes, and here's just think when I'm reading, just look at this gentleman, uh, and profuse beards and whiskers, or you can look at my beard and whiskers. <laughs> they are skillful at commerce and will haggle over a fraction of a cent. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that may give us a sense of who these Sogdians are. Already the Chinese things are very uh, sort of difficult people to bargain with, and in fact they weren't, so they were very popular. Now here are probably some Persian or part, um, Sogdian businessmen and traders bringing gifts 
in this uh, panel. And that's the Chinese perception of the song, and I think it's pretty uh, correct. And the beard, of course, reminds me of myself. Uh, these Sogdians weren't bound by a single religion. In fact, we have texts from Sogdians that are Christian, they're Buddhist, they are Manichaean, and Zoroastrian. They were uh, not bound by any specific religion. Uh, and that openness made them an excellent candidate for trade and interacting with different people throughout this Silk Road. The most interesting aspect of Sogdian religion is uh, this find, which this is from the British Museum, a Sogdian uh, text, a fragment, that was translated at least uh, most recently in the 1980s, which is part of a prayer. Now, if you know about Zoroastrianism, there are two prayers that are very important, the Ahunavarya prayer and the Ashambahu prayer. And in front of Johan, I will read the Avestan form, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Zoroastrian would know these hymns by heart. Uh, it's an important hymn. Asham bohu vahishtam asti ushta asti ushta ahmai hiat ashai vahishta asham. That is the Zoroastrian version. But these first two lines, it was discovered in the late 70s, early 80s by Ilya Gershevich, a great Iranist. That in fact, they're the beginning uh, well, the beginning is missing, but is that very same Ashen Bahu prayer in Saudi language. And that told us many things. This was a great discovery. These texts are, again, very fascinating, and it tells us that the scribe was probably a Zoroastrian and giving us a prayer in Saudi, which says, truth is best of all that is good, as desired what is being desired is truth for him who represents best truth. Asha, meaning truth, has an important concept uh, in the Zoroastrian tradition, and that is being, again, echoed again and again and again. So this is just a flavor of what kind of Sogdian text uh, we may find, but we also find artifacts, material culture. Here's a Sogdian panel. In the past 15 years in Western China, more tombs of these Sogdian traders are being found, and are elaborate. These people were very wealthy. They were able to pay for a lot of these panels. And this panel is again has been written now about several times. is a very interesting ceremony. First of all, there is a fire altar right there, and there's a priest with a palam probably that suggests that this is a Zoroastrian ceremony, or there's a Zoroastrian here involved. But what is also interesting is that there's a dog here, and that has been suggested is related to a Zoroastrian ceremony called Sakdit. That is when one passes away a dog that in the Zoroastrian text is mentioned to be a four-eyed dog, not that it literally has four eyes, uh, that has this other perception, to be able to recognize if someone has died, is dead or not. Uh, that is, animals have these perceptions of if somebody is dead or not, and these dogs are uh, specialists as such. So we find the dog, we find the uh, fire, and the priest. Something else that is, of course, interesting is you have these people who are actually cutting themselves like this with uh, place. Now, why would you do that? That's very un-Zoroastrian like, at least according to our Zoroastrian texts. You're not supposed to actually injure yourself in any way. Life is good, and you have to enjoy it in moderation. Uh, what is happening is, already in the 10th century in Tariq al-Bukhara, in these Eastern uh, Iranian texts uh, in Persian, uh, they tell us that there were these cer mourning ceremonies for an important figure called Siyabash, uh, a hero who was killed innocently where every year people uh, mourned his death and actually would uh, pull their hair, cry, and sometimes injure themselves. Although that was on Zoroastrians, these people did it along the Silk Road. And that, again, reminds us of this ceremony. We have a pictorial of this Tariq al being retelling us about what is going on in Khorasan, probably, again, a mourning ceremony, uh, and having the Zoroastrian connection. 